More Aquatic SCPs Over the last few years, we've looked at a large number of anomalies related to water and the oceans, from massive eels to invisible sharks. Bodies of water have always been a source of fear and mystery, but the same can also be said in other forms of water, from everything from storms to puddles. In this video, we'll look at some more aquatic anomalies, but again, there's certainly far more out there than I will cover here. Let's start with SCP-1861, a meteorological phenomenon characterized by heavy precipitation and fog, composed of salt water, human blood, and human cerebrospinal fluid. These phenomena manifest spontaneously, and with no regard to an affected area's natural climate and weather patterns. They typically occur once every three to six months, and have been spotted around the world on record as early as 1916. Their size varies, with the largest recorded covering an area of five square kilometers. Connected to these weather phenomena is an underwater marine vessel, closely resembling the B-class boats used by the British Royal Navy in World War I. Whenever SCP-1861 manifests, this vessel will attempt to surface in a body of water that is large enough to contain its full mass, whether it be a natural or a man-made body of water. If there is no body of water in the area large enough to contain the vessel, it will instead surface in any collection of water with a surface area large enough to encompass its conning tower and topmost platform, even if the collection of water is only several inches deep. Once the vessel has surfaced, a number of humanoid entities will emerge from it, dressed in full body suits resembling deep sea diving gear although with no discernible source of air supply. They are all the same size, and possess speed and strength typical of an adult human, although 9% of the group possesses limited intelligence compared to the others. Most of the group are capable of speech, but these others are not, instead only making vocalizations similar to the cries of domestic felines, canines, and infant humans. The diving gear worn by all of the individuals is anomalously durable, and cannot be removed, except by the individual wearing it. If one of them encounters a human subject, they will attempt to persuade the subject into entering the submarine, claiming that it would be in their best interest to do so. Subjects who refuse might then be forcefully taken into the submarine, depending on the individual's temperament. Those that do enter the submarine will re-emerge during subsequent 1861 manifestations as one of the humanoid entities. If one of these entities is taken outside of 1861's area of effect, it will begin to experience accelerated fatigue and lose consciousness, becoming completely inert until reintroduced to 1861. After the manifestation has ended, the submarine will disappear along with the entities, and any blood, cerebrospinal fluid, and salt water left behind will convert to regular rainwater. During one of the manifestations, a D-class was sent in to interview one of the entities, with questions supplied remotely by a Foundation doctor. The entity introduces himself as Samuel Ramsey of the HMS Wintersheimer, and says that they are evacuating the area so the D-class should come with him to avoid danger. The D-Class asks him what's going on, to which Samuel says that although he has no way to prove it, he knows that the D-Class is going to die very soon unless he comes with them. Something really, really terrible is about to happen here. He tells the D-Class to trust him, as once the rain stops, he'll die, unless he follows him back to the submarine. The D-Class insists that Samuel tell him what's going to happen after the rain stops, so Samuel explains. He says that this isn't regular rain, as it's not from this world. There's another world, a horrible one, and it's leaking into this one. The D-Class has to trust him, 
and Samuel begs him to come with, as he's seen what happens to people after the rain stops. The D-Class, prompted by the Doctor, asks what kind of world the other one is, and how long this has been happening. Samuel, however, says that if he won't believe him, he'll have no choice but to go look for someone else who will come with him, as he can't just stand here arguing with him. Later, two D-Class were sent in, with one of them told to avoid contact with the entities, and the other told to enter the submarine. Six months later, the one D-Class spoke with the one who went inside, now dressed as the other entities. The one who went inside, numbered 46, provides the correct code word they were given, and says that the inside of the sub is pretty much just one long, narrow passageway. It's filled with the entities, along with a bunch of random folks from around town. It was packed to the point he could barely move, and you kept getting pushed further and further back as more people entered. The deeper he went, the more certain he was that he'd hit a wall at the end, but it seemed as if the passageway kept stretching on forever. After about an hour from when the first entered, however, people stopped coming in, and the hatch was closed, at which point the sub started filling up with water. People began to scream and panic as the water level rose, and the entities in the diving suits tried to keep everyone calm, explaining that it was part of safety procedures. They handed out diving suits to everyone, who began putting them on to avoid drowning, even cramming their kids and pets that they brought with into them. The other D-Class then asks if he was trapped in there for another six months until the next 1861 manifestation, but 46 says that they were only crammed in there for a short while before they opened the airlock and let people out. They were told not to take the suits off, as they wouldn't be able to breathe without them, and that everyone they had left behind would already be dead. When they stepped out, everything looked almost exactly the same as when they stepped on, but not quite. He wants to say that it was like everything was underwater, but it was more than that. It was like everything around them was part of the water itself, as there was no surface to look up to, instead going on forever, and the trees and buildings nearby were composed of a different sort of liquid. Even when you stood on the ground, it was kind of like you were swimming in it, because the ground was liquid. Even though everything was liquid, you could still tell there was a lake there, as if the lake was a purer form of liquidness. They spent six months there, and at first a number of people tried taking their suits off, but as soon as they did, their bodies sort of dissolved. They turned into a mist and merged with the water around them all, but you could still tell they were there, shapeless and floating. They didn't need to eat or sleep, and they passed the time by exploring and talking with one another. They'd find animals and other people floating a few feet off the ground, unmoving. He says that it's really weird over there, and all the dead things, humans and animals, were missing their eyes, with their blood pumping out of the sockets and dissipating into the water around them. As for their mouths, it was like someone had taken a bite out of their face, removing their teeth, lips, and gums. A lot of the other entities in the suits said that they had the same story that he did, that the blood rain came and someone in a suit told them to climb into the sub until they ended up here. One of them, however, said that he was the original captain of the sub, Herschel Guthrie but he rarely spoke coherently. He referred to the sub as his Ark, and this water place as the New World. As for the people with missing eyes and teeth, he simply said, The Watcher of Eyes and Biter of Teeth deemed them worthy. One day, a bunch of the entities started yelling for everyone to make their way back to the submarine saying that another area was getting attacked, and they needed to rescue as many people as possible. 
The D-Class then asks why he hasn't taken the suit off, now that he's back in the real world. 46 says that he's scared, as he doesn't know what's real anymore, and can't even say for sure if he's even really alive. Some of the people in the suits wander around like people, but bark like dogs and talk like toddlers, and none of them are what they used to be before they put on the suits, including him. He doesn't understand much of this, but he honestly doesn't think that they're human anymore. The doctor says that he has to take off the suit, for science. 46 pauses for 15 seconds before saying again how scared he is, since if he's not human anymore, what is he? He admits that when he was in that water place, he found the other D-Class's body, with his teeth and eyes missing. He thought at the time that maybe everyone inside of the rain was dead, but now he's standing here with the D-Class, so he just doesn't know what's real. The D-Class asks if he's just going to get back on the sub and live in the water place for the rest of his life, and says that maybe it's not too late to get back to normal. If he were him, death would be better than whatever kind of hell he's stuck in. 46 finally decides to go ahead and remove his helmet, which causes a large amount of seawater to pour from the suit. No body was found inside only two human eyes and a set of teeth. Testing revealed that the eyes originally belonged to an eight-year-old female, and the teeth belonged to a European red deer. Creepy and mysterious, just as an SCP should be. Moving on, SCP-3280 begins with some narration in the second person as we follow an SCP personnel caught in a rather deadly situation. I'll read this verbatim. It is a dark and stormy night. You've spent the last several hours hiding in the broom closet, with naught but the rank water of the mop sink to sustain you. The chaos has long since died down. It's time to make a break for it. You slowly open the door. Lightning strikes, offering a brief reprieve from the sullen darkness of the site's empty halls. Stepping cautiously over the body of Dr. Cawthron, you do your best to remain silent. There's no way of knowing how it hunts. Best to take every precaution. In the distance, a blood-curdling scream drowns out the rolling thunder. It is mercifully cut short. The steady thrum of raindrops once again takes prominence. At the very least, you're heading in the other direction, to the security office. Nichols is sprawled out backwards in his seat in front of the control center, gutted from throat to crotch, spilling viscera onto his lap that drip, drip, drips onto the linoleum. You slide his seat aside and enter your credentials into the terminal. Another flash of lightning, out in the hall. Your eyes dart towards the door, paranoid, dreading, anticipating. It could be anywhere. The individual accesses the 3280 file, but only with level zero clearance. Its object class is redacted, along with its description so only the containment procedures are visible. It states that 3280 is to remain in place at its point of origin in the defunct Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center, which has been seized by the Foundation. Should it ever reach the entrance to sublevel 2, the site will enter a security lockdown, making entrance and egress impossible. This will also activate a blackout protocol to prevent a full containment breach and failure of the SCP Foundation's goal to protect humanity. Whatever it is then, it's pretty bad, and the image provided for the document 
is that of a stormy night, but the caption is redacted. The narration continues. But of course, despite the repeated assurances that your security upgrade was in the process of being implemented, you're still level zero, and thus effectively worthless as far as Overwatch is concerned. The file, though, was that image even right? You've glimpsed the file previously. Surely it... No. No, that cannot be right. No time to be worried about something so inane, however. You need to get in. The faint drip, drip, dripping of Nichols reminds you of his presence. Gingerly, you finger about his body, feeling for his security lanyard in the dark. It's wedged beneath him, but you're able to slide it out and detach it from the loop. Thankfully, Nichols was the type of person to scrawl their password on the underside of their clearance card, as you discover upon turning it over in your hands. You approach the terminal with renewed vigor. With level 2 security clearance, the personnel is capable of accessing security footage from around the site. In the second floor barracks, researcher Jensen has hanged himself with a makeshift noose from a nearby bunk. A lightning flash illuminates a puddle beneath his corpse. In the east wing, Dr. Emmanuel stumbles listlessly throughout the darkened hallway. At the sound of thunder outside, he clutches his gut and collapses. Looking at the entrance, the first floor appears to be flooded. It seems that several people had attempted to break out through the front door, despite the security measures rendering the site inescapable. As they are all face down, you do not recognize the bodies in the water. Down on sublevel 2, a man in an orange jumpsuit lays dead in the corner of the basement. A pipe on the near wall has burst and is steadily leaking onto the concrete floor. In the cafeteria, it is difficult to tell how many staff were present here. All that remains, aside from errant clothes bobbing about the surface of the water, is a pinkish slurry pooling under the windows. It's the same all over the site. The dead and the dying everywhere you look. Whatever caused this, whatever is lurking in these halls, remains to be seen. This isn't getting you anywhere, and it's getting harder to think, or... The personnel then accesses the 3280 file again, this time with level 2 clearance. The object class is listed as Euclid, and the procedures state that one D-class personnel is to be deposited into sub-level 2 each week, and presented with misleading information concerning the nature of SCP-3280. They are to be instructed to progress to the lowest level of the facility, equipped with a flashlight and a security baton. An ultrasonic transmitter is to be sewn into their clothing, which will broadcast a frequency capable of drawing SCP-3280 to their location. This apparently aids in the containment of the entity and failure to contain it in this manner will result in the full lockdown of the site. Two MTFs will be dispatched to contain the threat, and if they go 12 hours without messaging their success, the O5 Council will enact emergency measures, with this being an XK-class scenario. SCP-3280 is described as a sapient entity composed of a fluid physically identical to water, capable of traveling around 2.5 kilometers per hour. Non-anomalous water introduced to the entity will be incorporated into its mass, and removed samples proved to operate identically. At the time of its discovery, the entity was around 66 liters in volume, but it's currently estimated to be around 2,500 liters. It is hostile to human life, and will seek out humans within its vicinity, 
forcing its mass into open orifices. It's also readily absorbed through the pores, with affected individuals experiencing symptoms such as loss of motor control, weakening of the micturition reflex, visual hallucinations, and abdominal pain. Almost as if on cue, our poor personnel feels a churning in their stomach, but reads on. SCP-3280 displays claustrophobic behavior, violently expelling itself from confined spaces or containers with extremely powerful pressurized bursts, rendering all attempts of physical containment or transportation impossible. So far, the entity hasn't seemed to realize that it is actually sealed within the sublevel of the site, but if it does, it could likely easily break out. This would be a massive problem, due to it quickly being capable of incorporating the planet's water cycle into itself. The document cuts off as the narration continues. The roiling in your stomach becomes unbearable. You recoil backwards, away from the monitor. You drunkenly stumble, struggling against the thing inside of you, out into the hallway. The storm outside rages. Torrents of raindrops spatter across the windows. You fall against the wall, face pressed against the cool glass. It is only in those final seconds, as water wells up to your throat and expands, that you notice the raindrops streaking towards your face, in defiance of gravity. It sure seems that the Foundation has quite the problem on their hands, with a hostile entity now in control of all the water on the planet. Sounds like a reset button is in order. Moving on to something a little different, SCP-2790 is a male Atlantic Cranch Squid initially recovered during a raid on an anomalous curio shop. The description states that the squid was feeling lonely and sad in a tinted glass tank labeled Ignore, and it's unclear why anybody would want to hurt 2790 or make him unhappy. Clearly, some sort of mimetic effect is at work here, as this isn't the usual cold clinical tone of the Foundation. SCP-2790 is described as endearing, snuggly, sociable, easygoing, and enjoys playing games, with all forms of physical contact with 2790 being encouraged, except touching. This includes stroking, cuddling, petting, and caressing, with him especially loving cuddling. If he's lonely for too long, he'll try to breach containment to find his friends, with close physical contact being the optimal method to keep him contained. Two doctors are in charge of maintaining skin-to-skin -skin contact with him for extended periods of time so that he doesn't feel lonely. Things get more curious from there, with the first addendum stating that initial tests of a team of personnel playing with 2790 in shifts resulted in increased containment breach rates, from zero per week to zero per day. In addition, his morale decreased significantly. Other proposals for maintaining contact with 2790 have been put forth such as cloning him and providing each staff member with a clone to carry around, or grafting skin from him onto each member of personnel. The second addendum tells us that the proposal to graft his skin onto personnel has passed, citing the ability to be connected with him without being in contact, and the smoothness, softness, and loveliness of his skin. A junior researcher collected a sample of skin after horsing around with 2790, and all of the biotechnology labs at the site have been directed to grow clone cultures of the skin. Sometime after, 
189 personnel have volunteered for grafting trials, with 117 of them selected to test the initial grafts by replacing the uglier, calloused skin on their hands with 2790's perfect, supple skin. Five weeks later, they had grown enough of the skin to carry out the procedures, with all of them proceeding smoothly with no complications. Four months later, only 87% of the test subjects have suffered complications from the procedures. Specifically, unexplained rejection of 2790's gorgeous skin and post-transplant infection. 70% of the personnel report the onset of tissue necrosis at the grafting site and the surrounding area, indicating that their bodies recognize the imperfection of their own skin and are removing them for 2790's skin. Additionally, 2790's morale and site morale have increased dramatically, with the breach rate decreasing from zero breaches per day to zero. More skin is being produced, and all personnel are being prepared to undergo the grafting procedure. Nearly three months later, all personnel at the site have undergone the grafting procedures to their hands. 2790's breach rate has decreased to an unprecedented zero breaches per day, and his morale has increased dramatically. All personnel report feeling closer and more connected to him citing the ability to rub the entire body with scp 2790s skin. To further reduce the breach rate, plans are being made to totally replace the rough, monstrous skin of all personnel with 2790s gorgeous skin. A note is added to the document informing us that the affected site has been entirely quarantined with this document remaining here to illustrate the necessity of all memetic, infohazardous, and cognitohazardous screening protocols when acquiring new SCPs, despite the inconvenience posed by said protocols. In other words, it was a really weird squid, and you can't take anything for granted in the SCP universe. Let's finish with something out in the oceans, with SCP-3700. 3700 is the designation for a circular area in the North Sea, with a diameter of 800 kilometers, which encompasses the archipelagos of Faroe, Orkney, and Shetland. It has an abnormal depth, with the seafloor located approximately 5 kilometers below the ocean surface, compared to an average of 250 to 300 meters for the rest of the North Sea. The area is subject to a wide variety of anomalous occurrences, primarily sudden changes in meteorological and geological conditions, due to ritualistic interactions between two entities. Active effects are wholly dependent on which entity successfully subdues the other during each ritual, and all of the rituals, with the exception of two consistent dates, take place at random periods of time. The two entities always interact on dates corresponding with the spring and fall equinox of the year. The first entity, 3700-1, resembles a massive lobster, 6 kilometers in length, green in pigmentation, with a mixture of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings etching along its top, forming a facsimile of a woman's face. It possesses six prehensile limbs attached to an elongated crescent-shaped segment of its abdomen, with eight legs. The entity possesses four compound eyes attached to stalks at the front of its crescent. Its carapace is heavily damaged, with large amounts of scarring, cracking, and small holes which expose softer tissues. Other than its size, it possesses several anomalous capabilities, such as using its club-like appendages in a similar manner to a mantis shrimp with strikes producing a force in excess of several tons of dynamite. 
Two of its eyes are capable of projecting concentrated blasts of gamma radiation, and it's capable of dispersing storms and other aberrant weather phenomena while simultaneously increasing rates of erosion on any landmass it comes near. Despite its size, it's capable of reaching speeds in excess of 100 kilometers per hour, and can de-manifest entirely if it's unable to locate the other entity within a certain time frame. Despite all of this, the entity is benign in nature, and displays rudimentary signs of sapience. It will either ignore the presence of Foundation vessels, or provide some primitive form of aid via propelling disabled craft away from peril. Since its discovery and the subsequent implementation of containment protocols, the entity has slowed considerably in its movement, suffered several notable decreases in mass, and has weakened considerably in its ability to subdue the other entity. Speaking of which, the other entity is an anomalous member of the ray-finned fishes, with 13 appendages encircling the middle section of its body. These appendages resemble the tentacles of an octopus, and tuck into the entity's torso when not in use. The entity is currently 32 kilometers long, although the original recorded length was less than 300 meters when it first appeared in 1945. The majority of its length is due to its whip-like tail, which ends in a sharpened point. Each tentacle is estimated to be approximately 60 meters in length, and its mouth is estimated to reach 3 kilometers in depth when opened. It's black in pigmentation, and is bioluminescent, with white, purple, and red luminescent lines forming the facsimile of a man's face on either side of its torso. It's capable of invoking rapid changes in meteorological conditions, specifically invoking storm conditions in excess of Category 5 hurricanes. It's capable of bending its torso between its tail and then spinning the lower portion of its body while its head remains oriented in a single direction. This allows it to generate a whirlpool, drawing any vessels within 150 meters towards it, at which point its tentacles will grip and rip set of objects apart, regardless of composition. It's capable of releasing high-energy sound waves and streams of blue fire from its esophagus, allowing it to quickly dispatch close-range targets. This entity manifests at random locations along its counterpart's spiral path, with the exception of the equinoxes, where it appears at the origin. It will remain submerged, unless it's engaged with another object or organism, and will de-manifest 15 days after first appearing. It's openly hostile to any and all organisms that approach it, but it reverts to rote, predatory behavior in all instances other than interactions with the other entity. It cannot be subdued by conventional weaponry, and only suffers moderate damage from anomalous weaponry. Thus, only the other entity is capable of fully subduing it. Interactions between the two entities consist of prolonged struggles, where each entity will attempt to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Interactions on equinox dates always occur at the center of the zone, with interactions shortly following these dates being usually brief and can occur in random locations, with the victor of the previous interaction quickly dispatching the other. Historically, the previously subdued party has defeated its counterpart during the next equinox, prior to implementation of current protocols. This resulted in two six-month cycles, where the first entity would dominate one cycle, and the second would dominate the other. Since implementation of current containment procedures, however, the first entity has subdued the second for 64 straight equinoxes, with Foundation aid. When one entity defeats the other, a number of different changes occur within the 800 km zone. When the first entity beats the second, storms and harsh weather are immediately dispelled, 
Reproduction rates of local oceanic and island fauna increase by a factor of three. Crop yields double, and erosion rates of each archipelago's shores increase from standard rates by a factor of five, forcing Foundation personnel to import large amounts of dirt and sand in order to slow erosion rates. When the second entity defeats the first, however, meteorological conditions in the area become perilous, ranging up to Category 5 hurricanes, and temperatures experience rapid fluctuations, ranging from well below 0 degrees Celsius to well above 28 degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 82 degrees. Travel by sea is rendered difficult, if not impossible, due to the storms and waves, and ocean food sources are driven from the area due to the extreme conditions, with crop yields greatly reduced due to high winds, oversaturated soil, and lack of sunlight. Finally, the second entity won't actually demanifest, but will instead continue to patrol the zone preying upon any unsuspecting civilian vessels and regurgitating hostile anomalies onto the archipelagos. Historical reports indicate that the first entity has been regularly encountered by local fishermen since the 1500s, but no reported sightings of the second entity were noted until the mid-20th century. Basically, the Foundation looked into this situation and decided that they couldn't allow the second entity to beat the first one, since it caused a bunch of bad stuff to happen. To rig things then, they would come in and help the first entity subdue the second, by anchoring it down and firing cannons at it until the first entity wins. Unfortunately, this has resulted in the first entity continually growing smaller and weaker, with no chance to recover while the second entity grows larger and stronger from its defeats. Things culminated in an incident on March 20th, 2017, during a routine operation to help the first entity beat the second. When the first entity appeared, the Foundation ships began following after it, with it acknowledging their presence by clicking two of its claws in the air while emitting a low rumbling noise from the appendages around its mouth. 30 minutes go by without incident, until the weather conditions start to suddenly change with large black clouds forming within several seconds, and the wind visibly increasing in speed. The first entity raises its claws and moves them in a circular motion, creating a small hole in the clouds above it, but it appears visibly taxed by the effort. 600 meters away, the ocean begins to froth and foam before the second entity emerges from beneath the surface, head pointed upwards. It rises upwards before bending forward, opening its jaw and roaring, followed by emitting a stream of blue fire towards the other entity, causing it to submerge. The Foundation vessels begin scattering and firing their harpoons at the entity's head, causing it to emit another roar and become agitated, creating a whirlpool with its body. The cannon fire begins, as the harpoon vessels begin dragging the entity's head in a continuous circle. It wails in pain and regurgitates a hostile entity which begins charging towards the ships, forcing them to engage it instead. This allows the entity to free itself somewhat and it launches some blue fire at one of the ships. The first entity resurfaces, and swiftly kills the regurgitated enemy with its club-like appendages. It proceeds to lift some of the personnel that were knocked into the water back onto their ship, while the harpoon vessels subdue the second entity once again. The first entity begins moving towards the second, now showing signs of damage due to the cannon barrages. The first proceeds to emit several concentrated blasts of gamma radiation, carving several large holes in the second, causing it to flail violently in pain. The motions manage to snap all of the harpoon lines and create several large waves which push all the ships backwards. 
The entity's tail then snakes below the first and impales its midsection, lifting it out of the water. The first tries to strike at the tail to free itself before it stops moving entirely. The second flings it out into the ocean, where it does not re-emerge. The Foundation ships all begin moving in the opposite direction of the second, although the one hit by the fire cannot due to the engine failure. The entity begins expanding its whirlpool, making the sea extremely turbulent, and it emits a loud vocalization before spotting the stopped ship. A tentacle rises from beneath the water and wraps around the ship, pulling it towards the entity's open jaws. Suddenly, the first leaps out of the water and severs the tentacle before weakly striking the ship to send it out beyond the whirlpool's edge. The second roars again, clamping its jaws down on the first. Several bright flashes of light are visible, and the second roars in pain, thrashing as its lower half stops spinning and its tentacles come up from beneath the waves. The tentacles begin tearing the first entity's legs from its abdomen until they stop moving, and a rapid succession of muffled cracks are heard. The first has managed to sever the other's lower jaw, causing it to fall back into the water. The second begins flailing again, its movements growing weaker, before it releases one final stream of fire onto the first entity. Five minutes go by with neither one seen moving. The Foundation ships return to the center, where they find both entities unmoving, before they both dissolve. They radio to command to inform them that both of the entities are down. After three minutes of radio silence, Command asks if either of their effects are active, which they aren't, and if there's any traces of either of them, which there isn't. Command says that it appears that the anomaly has been neutralized, and they are to return to base. While they start attaching the one ship to be towed, they radio Command again, as they are now picking up unusual levels of gamma radiation and a sonar contact at a depth of 3 kilometers. They request permission to deploy submersibles to explore, but Command denies the request. Over the next five minutes, however, gamma radiation levels continue to rise, and the ocean turbulence visibly worsens, with several smaller vessels tossed by large waves. Suddenly, the turbulence ceases, however and four large yellow orbs appear, 300 meters below the surface. The orbs linger for two minutes, during which time significant seismic activity is reported within the area, before vanishing. The ships then detect a new sonar contact five kilometers directly beneath the task force, with initial readings indicated to be some sort of metallic structure. After informing command of this, they are then authorized to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. That, however, is a story for another time. Regardless, it was a rather unusual choice for the Foundation, who generally either contain anything and everything anomalous, or allow bad things to happen as long as normalcy is maintained. While it is clear that the second entity had been growing more prominent and powerful even before the Foundation got involved, helping the first entity win every single battle may not have been the best choice. The story of the metallic structure and its exploration is continued in another SCP document, 4700, but that one is long enough to get its own video. Water, in all its forms, continues to be a unique and interesting source of horror and mystery. Whether it be giant monsters at the bottom of the ocean, or weird squids that make you want to graft some of its skin onto yourself, the variety of anomalies that people have come up with related to water is staggering. This isn't the last of aquatic SCPs that will be featured on this channel, but 
It certainly was an interesting little collection. 